sugar. It is a sign of insulin resistance. So while anybody's blood sugar will go up a little bit, it should stay in that 70 to 90 range, you know? So if it's down in the uh, below 70 sometimes, in the 60s sometimes, and, and then it starts going up, uh, and it's not going to go above 100, you know? It's gonna still stay in that range. So if you're getting into the 120s, 150s, 180s, you know, if you're getting up there, or if you're in uh, in Canada, if you're getting above five, for example, 5.5, 5, uh, or whatever, then then that's still an indicator of insulin resistance. So uh, so don't think of the Dawn effect as oh that's just something that happens to everybody. If you have that effect, it means you have insulin resistance. Hello, welcome to the Fixed Blood Sugar webinar. I am Leslie and I'm here with Dr. Scott Saunders. How are you, Dr. Saunders, today? I'm doing great. Life is good. Awesome. I am so glad. We, you know what, I've had a lot of questions come in this week, which is great. That is why we do these webinars. We want to help you guys on your journey. And so I'm going to make sure that I get to as many of those as possible. Wow, there's already 82 people that hopped on right away. Nice work, guys. So if you can ask your questions that come up in the Q&A, best place for me to manage those. So I'm going to get to as many of those as we possibly can while also going through some of these emails that I got. So lots of questions today. We're going to be talking about best practices for testing, uh, checking your blood sugar, when to check, what do you use? I get a lot of questions about those things. And so I think it's really good to talk about that. I know we get questions from people that say, you know, what should my numbers be after I eat? Or why are my numbers high in the morning? And so we want to go into all of that stuff. I think that morning question is one of our top three questions. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Why yeah. are my blood sugar numbers higher in the morning? Raise your hand if you have often wondered that. Hit the raise hand button and, and, and let us know if you've wondered why your numbers are high in the morning. I'm going to give you guys a second here to do that because I'm just curious. And we'll see if that's a common issue for people. Hit the raise hand button there right on. Well, you won't be able to do that on YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're seeing this, but okay. Oh, and now I can't even see it. So well, there we go. Oh my, already 17 of you. 18, 16, 17. So people are raising their hands. Yes, they wondered why. You know what? Let's just start with that question. I think that's what we should do. First of all, I'm just going to let you know, Dr. Saunders is not your doctor. And so please consult with your medical provider before you implement any of the things that we discuss here today. Okay. So let's dig into that. I want to talk about that. Why? Why would our numbers be high in the morning? We've just come out of a fast. We slept all night. What's going on? You know, that that is a very common question because uh, that, the, that idea, my stomach is empty. I didn't eat anything. Um, so consider this, that uh, your blood sugar uh, is a compilation of a whole bunch of different factors that are involved in this. And, and so we're taught and we think just to make things simple that, oh, if I ate sugar, then my blood sugar is going to go up. And that's that's the the one to one kind of thing, like like that's how it goes up. Um, but but actually, there's a lot more factors involved. Uh, your liver makes sugar. It's called gluconeogenesis. And so your liver can take protein and make it into sugar and it can make your blood sugar go up uh, just, just from your liver. And, and there's a hormone called glucagon. Uh, the, the pancreas makes it. So the pancreas makes insulin and the insulin uh, says, uh, uh, tells the liver to take sugar in uh, to the cells and it tells you all of your other cells, your muscle cells in your body, take sugar into your cells. Um, but then when you stop eating, the insulin goes down and glucagon goes up. And glucagon starts going up when the blood sugar starts dropping low. And that tells your liver, hey, um, put, make, put, put sugar out. So uh, the, the liver has some storage that stores not a lot, just like a, a, enough for one day. Uh, not even a day. Uh, it, it'll store what's called glycogen, which is kind of like a starch. 
and and it'll it'll break off those glycogens and send out glucose and keep your glucose level up and then what happens in the morning is is now you've gone all night you're not absorbing any sugar from your intestines you have insulin resistance somewhat uh, the insulin level is starting to go down because the glucose is starting to drop down and then your pancreas starts making glucagon and that tells your liver hey make some sugar so in the morning you start making sugar but at the same time you're insulin resistant and you make cortisol that doubles your insulin resistance so now you've got a double whammy or triple whammy one you're making sugar um two you're you're already insulin resistant and number three you have this release of cortisol from your adrenal glands that tell your body to become more insulin resistant so then that just shoots your sugar up and so people often wonder what the heck what is this dawn effect that that in the morning my blood sugar gets so elevated uh, and that's it it's these three factors that are involved um, that that um, are causing you to have high blood sugar it is a sign of insulin resistance so while anybody's blood sugar will go up a little bit it should stay in that 70 to 90 range you know so if it's down in the uh, below 70 sometimes in the 60s sometimes and, and then it starts going up uh, and it's not going to go above 100 you know it's going to still stay in that range so if you're getting into the 120s 150s 180s you know if you're getting up there or if you're in uh, in Canada if you're getting above five for example 5.5 5, 5, 5 uh, or whatever then then that's still an indicator of insulin resistance. So, uh, so don't think of the Dawn effect as, oh, that's just something that happens to everybody. If you have that effect, it means you have insulin resistance. So that's why we test at that point. Um, if it was just like a normal effect, then, then it wouldn't be useful for us to test in the morning. So today we're talking about testing. And when's the best time to test? In the morning, fasting, why? because you're not having the effect of what you just ate, you're looking at, your stomach is empty. What is What are your hormones doing? How are your hormones managing your, your blood sugar? And, and if it gets up there into the 150s or, you know, or o over five, <laughs> if you're uh, in Canada, then, then, then you have insulin resistance and that's still something to deal with. And that's a lot of, the questions surrounding the phase one. How, when do I stop phase one and go into phase two? And there's no time because for some people it's going to be weeks or even days. We've had people say, yeah, within a few days it came down to normal. I went into phase two. Um, uh, other people are, it's going to be months. Uh, we've had people six months say, you know, I've been on phase one for six months. Uh, and it's just very gradually going down the, uh, that morning, morning um, blood sugar. So that means the insulin resistance is very gradually dropping. And there's a lot of other reasons for that. We talked about um, stress. When people have a lot of stress, they um, make they're more insulin resistant, and so it's a lot more difficult to get your insulin sensitivity up when you're when you're when you have a lot of stress. And that has nothing to do with what you're eating specifically. Some people stress eat, of course, that's an issue. Um, but, but just having stress is enough to make you more insulin resistant. So even on phase one, it may take a long time depending on what else is going on in your life, what else you're doing, how much you're sleeping affects it. If, if you sleep less, you get more insulin resistant. Uh, you know, we haven't talked about that very much, have we? Uh, that that sleep is a big deal if if you're not sleeping then especially if you're not sleeping like early in the evening we talk about the 6 10 reset to go to bed by 10 o'clock that is uh, that's how you reset the system and if you don't if you go to bed after midnight for example um it's uh, your blood sugar is going to go up even if you eat great food uh, just having that extra insulin resistance uh from from not sleeping so uh, all of those factors get involved and, uh, and um, the for the testing purposes, it doesn't matter because 
there's, uh, there's always that morning uh, blood glucose should stay uh, 70 to 90. And if it's not 70 to 90, then look at why. And it could be what you're eating. It could be insulin resistance for other reasons like stress or not sleeping or something like that. All right, that's good. Uh, we have a lot of people that ask, you know, they kind of want to check and see after they eat, uh, assuming they don't have a continuous glucose monitor, monitor so they, they aren't able to see that right away. But they want to check and see maybe an hour after they've eaten, they want to see what their numbers are. Where should your numbers fall after you eat? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, okay, so there, the number should be below 120. Um, and ideally, uh, uh, below a hundred, uh, it, it, you really, your blood sugar does not need to go above a hundred, even after eating. Uh, and so minimalist insulin resistance, it's going to go to 105 or something like that. Um, I don't know where those numbers exactly fall in, in Canadian terms. Um, because up to five is like just, just around a hundred. Um, so five in Canada is around a hundred. So if it's, if it's over that, uh, then, then that still indicates some insulin resistance. And then it also depends on what you eat. If you have something with a very high glycemic index, uh, if you're eating watermelon, for example, and you have a, a whole, you know, half a watermelon, um, then, then that's a lot of sugar that you just dumped into your system. Uh, and you know, anybody, even if they don't have insulin resistance, the blood sugar can go up, you know, 120, 150. Um, uh, the, the rule that we use for like the glucose tolerance test, where you give someone a 75 gram glucose load and they, it's, it's essentially caro syrup, right? 75 grams of caro syrup. They drink it down and, uh, and if it goes over 160, then that's, uh, diagnostic for diabetes. So that's, so less than that, they go, oh, you're okay. But I don't look at it that way because really it's not a yes or no question. It's a, it's a, where are you on the scale question? And, and they say, here is diabetes, but what about just below that? What does that mean? If you're 150, um, when, uh, when you, when you drink that, uh, that glucose load, um, um, well, what that means is you have mild insulin resistance. And so uh, uh, we, we look at hemoglobin A1C as another indicator for diabetes. And, you know, 6.5 is a cutoff. Boom, there you have it. Uh, and if you're 6.4, you don't have diabetes. If you're 6.5, you have diabetes. And, and really, where is that? Well, you know, that's just you have to define it somehow to use the word. Um, but, but really look at it as the scale. So when somebody has a 5.4 hemoglobin A1C, they have half the death rate of somebody who has a 5.8 prediabetes. So that's not even diabetes, but that is double, double the death rate. Um, so it, it's not a minor thing to, to think of where are you on the scale? and say, you know, it really is better to be lower. It really is, you should be on phase one until you are between 70 and 90, yeah, or 70 and 100, I would allow that, like you say, after you're eating. Okay, so I just wanna clarify this, because Anonymous asks, when does a pre-diabetic condition develop into full type two, which you kind of just talked about, and I'm, it says, I mean, what is the borderline blood sugar count between the two? Um, so uh, the hemoglobin A1C I already said is 6.5. That, that's that, that's that um, line that's drawn. Um, and then the, uh, the blood sugar, uh, 160, 150, I guess, is what they're saying now. Uh, if it goes over 150, you have diabetes. If it's under 150, you don't have diabetes. So if someone is like, oh, wow, I think I'm, I have prediabetes, what, what should they do? Ah, that's a good question. You should do exactly what people with type 2 diabetes do. Why? Because you could have insulin resistance for years. You could have it for decades before you actually get high blood sugar. Your glucose is not a good measure for type 2. 
um, because the problem is too much. And, and one of the too much is too much insulin. And insulin resistance is what is causing all of the complications of type 2 diabetes, like Alzheimer's disease and kidney failure, or dialysis and amputations of, of the legs and all of that. There are people who ha already have kidney failure. They're already in renal failure before they even get high blood sugar. Why? Because of the insulin resistance. And I've seen this. I've seen people going into renal failure um, who have normal blood sugar. When we check them out and their insulin is really high, they're super insulin resistant, but they, their pancreas is putting out a ton of insulin and keeping their blood sugar normal all the time. So the blood sugar is normal, but the insulin's super high. And so they have a lot of insulin resistance and that still creates those problems with renal failure and, and the brain problems and the eye and going blind, all those things are really insulin problems and not sugar problems. So just because you have normal sugar does not mean you're out of the woods. Uh, really, if you have insulin resistance, you've got to deal with that. All right. Marty says, why is my sugar high at night? Um, well, there, there's, there's a lot of different possibilities of why your blood sugar could be high at night. It could have something to do with what you're eating during the day, um, when you eat, what you eat, how much you eat. Those, those are important factors to consider. Uh, another thing to consider is stress. If you're stressed at night uh, or something like that, if you have um, any kinds of habits, people who um, uh, drink uh, wine, for example, with dinner, I've had problem, people have problems with that. Or are people who have uh, certain types of teas? Uh, licorice tea is actually has a sweetener and it stimulates the sweet glands. And so people think, well, I didn't put any sugar in it. Uh, but sometimes the sweet can cause your pancreas to prepare uh, and, and you end up making extra sugar and the blood sugar goes up. Um, uh, stress we talked about. Uh, so um, why it's that way at night uh, is, a, is a really good question, but consider first um, whatever you're putting into your mouth and then second of all, uh, whatever kinds of stress you have. A couple different questions about berberine. So Alan is asking if he can use berberine and metformin together. Um, yes, they can be used together, but you don't need to. Um, you, can, you can use one or the other. Uh, they essentially do the same thing and you're not going to get a greater benefit uh, by, by using them together. And the other question about berberine is, I just want to find it here. Oh yeah, uh, Jim said, could Dr. Saunders talk about the pros and cons of berberine? Is it safe to use berberine instead of metformin and why? We haven't talked about berberine for a little while. Yeah, so okay. So um, berberine is a, an extract of, um, of a, a lot of different places, actually. It's, it's, a, um, uh, it's a, a, a chemical um, uh, bioflavonoid, uh, no, it's not like, um, that comes from the barberry plant, and that's kind of how it got its name. But it's, um, uh, it's also other plants uh, have berberine, and uh, so... We've gotten several different extracts, I think, uh, in our supplement from different sources. Um, and uh, what berberine is, um, uh, it, it, the, the, what it does is it blocks you from using sugar for energy. Uh, and because and it blocks that, all of its effects are based on that blocking the sugar for energy. So. Um, when you see it used all over the place for a lot of different things, um, it's used for diabetes because it blocks you from using sugar for energy and kind of forces you to use fat for energy. So it, it makes it easier to switch from a sugar burning metabolism to a fat burning metabolism. Um, so that's great for diabetes, right? Well, that's what metformin does. So like I said, they can, they can be taken together, but they don't need to be. You can just take the berberine. Um, and But uh, berberine is also used for a lot of other reasons, which is why we didn't put it in the supplement. So like 
synochroma uh, doesn't have berberine in it. Well, why not? Because berberine has to be able to be used for a lot of different uh, other reasons too. Um, for anti-aging, uh, people actually uh, age slower when they burn fat for energy instead of sugar for energy. And so people use it for anti-aging. Um, for cancer, it's used in a, to, as a support for a lot of different types of cancer. Um, for the same reason, cancer needs sugar to grow, and this blocks you from using sugar, blocks the cancer cell from using sugar. And sugar is not efficient for using fat for energy, so they don't grow very well. So, um, so berberine has been shown to be useful uh, for, in cancer. So uh, because it's used in a lot of different places, um, it is, it's something that has, you know, its own, it's separate, um, used by itself. Um, the, uh, the disadvantages of berberine are uh, energy production. If you don't switch to fat burning very easily uh, and, and it blocks your sugar burning, then you may notice that. And some people do get uh, cramps in their muscles, for example. Um, and it's the same kind of thing that formin does. Uh, but other than that, it doesn't, it, it doesn't have any of the effects on like metformin does on the liver. Um, so I think, I think it's pretty safe there. Um, so that's it. That's berberine in a nutshell. All right. I'm going to actually share my screen here because I want to show you our website. There we go. So this is martinwebinar.com. Uh, I, I remind everybody often that this is kind of the hub where you guys can go to get information. Um, but we have two webinars that we do each week. You can see the Fixed Blood Sugar webinar and the Healthy Heart webinar. They're both free. You can register for those for free. Uh, and I want to show you links to our YouTube channel. So you can find all of our past webinars, 300 plus webinars, guys that you can find on our YouTube channel. So you can learn a lot if you go to bartonwebinar.com. Click those links to the YouTube channel and then subscribe so you get notified every time we upload a new video. We have our frequently asked questions, which I'll just tell you, some of you are probably asking some of these right now. Are sweeteners okay? But look at that. Why are my blood sugars higher in the morning? Good questions here that are important, I think, for you guys to check out. And then all of these products. So here's berberine. What I wanted to mention to you guys was if you use code webinar25, that's one word, you will save 25% on anything that you purchase. So uh, you can see milk thistle. Why did we put milk thistle with that, Dr. Saunders? Because it, uh, it helps the liver. Um, one of the issues with berberine is um, is because it blocks the, the sugar uh, using glucose, uh, in a type two diabetic, you want to make sure that the uh, the liver can uh, detox rapidly in this. That's what the milk thistle is. It's a it's a detox. Okay, and it says here to take two capsules once per day. I know someone's going to ask that. And actually, you know what? I think I spread mine out. I think I take one in the morning and one at night. And I think we yeah, I I started that. I, I told you about that. The, the, the berberine actually, uh, yeah, you can take it once a day. Um, but it seems to work better to have it split twice a day. All right. So uh, also you will find all of our other products here too. The diabetes solution kit is what we talk about a lot. You'll find that here. Let me see. Let me go back. And this is just that small book that basically is what Dr. Saunders recommends to the people that come into his office. And you can get the digital version of that for under $20. You can also get the hard copy. Uh, cost more to get that, but they can ship that to you. So check those out. Again, use code webinar25. That is one word, webinar25. Also look at this new fiber greens bag. We got a new, those of you who are fiber greens lovers, used to be in a canister. Look at it. It's in a bag now. Isn't that fun? Okay. Just had to share that. All right, here we go. Let's move on to some more questions. Again, if you want to post those in the Q&A, I can work through those a little bit easier. So, okay, we got that one. Brian says, my name is Brian from Scotland. I've been on before, been doing well, but recently my numbers are back up to 270 and more. I had a dental infection. Could this be cause for the rise in numbers as I haven't changed anything? I'm really confused. 
Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Actually, yes. Yes, infections definitely make your blood glucose go up. It makes, uh, makes you uh, make more uh, cortisol. Uh, that's the stress hormone because any stressor of the body, including infections, but um, like uh, some people exercising more puts extra stress, they make more cortisol and, and the cortisol causes them to be more insulin resistant uh, and makes the blood sugar go up. So uh, when you have high cortisol and you have some insulin resistance, it, it is very hard to get the blood sugar into the normal range. And, and th th there's no reason to even try. Um, when, diabetes, when diabetics are brought into the hospital, and of course they're in a hospital for a reason, right? They're sick, they have some kind of infection or, or some terrible illness or in injuries or whatever. And, and so they're making a bunch of cortisol and their blood sugars are super high. Well, um, when they tried to get their blood sugars down to normal by using insulin injections and they've got you know, continuous monitoring, they got a nurse right there and everything, they had so many more deaths um, that because of trying to get their blood sugar normal, they finally said, forget it, forget it. We're not going to, we're not going to look for normal blood sugar anymore in, in diabetics who are stressed or in the hospital. Um, some hospitals, uh, uh, one of our local hospitals, actually, uh, they were, they were, uh, telling one of my patients that, um, that they needed to keep the blood sugar uh, normal, and she and and, uh, and so we talked about it, and, and I told her, no, just just tell them you're okay, <laughs> that you can manage it, um, and and she did, and she did well. So yes, the the answer to your question is yes. If you have um, infections of any kind uh, or even stress of any kind, it is really hard to get the blood sugar normal. It's really interesting. I had physical therapy on my knee today. I had knee surgery a couple months ago and my physical therapist had said, you know, I just mentioned that I was feeling more pain in my knee than I normally do. And then he asked me about my stress and said that, I don't know the medical part of it, but that when you are under stress, you feel pain more than normal also. So boy, we got to really work on reducing our stress in our lives, don't we? Yeah. Bring that lot on these webinars and Dr. Saunders talks about it a lot. So probably we're probably due for another webinar just on stress alone and stress reduction. So if you guys are in the chat, feel free to post some things or share some things with everyone here that you like to do. One of the things that I have implemented is uh, more breathing techniques, uh, breath work, I guess. And I know Dr. Saunders mentioned the book Breath or Breathe by Nestor. I've heard it pronounced two different ways. Right. Nestor. Is that right? I think so. I, I think it's breath and it's James Nestor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and there, there's just a lot of different, I, I did some Wim Hof Googling. You can go to YouTube and find Wim Hof five minute breath work session. If you want. I, mean, I use that. Oh, you do. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That's I use I that. Doing. Yeah. Um, and actually it was interesting the day that I did it, my heart rate variability was much higher the next morning. I thought that was interesting. So who knows, but we'd love to hear from you guys. Share, share that among, um, amongst yourselves. It'd be good to know what you do to reduce stress. I was chatting with someone else yesterday and we were talking about how people are finding these little things that they call dopamine hits and like just these little things that bring them joy. And they found that that really helps to take stress away. And uh, for one lady, she loves bright colors. So she dresses in bright colors and that makes her very happy. And, you know, we all have different things. Dr. Saunders doesn't get stress relief by laying on the beach. We learned that on one of the webinars, right? No, it doesn't That's help. Right. No. Way but too exer chill. exercise does. I go out for a five, five K. I just run a five K. I have a, a track, not a track, but you know, a, a streets around my house and I have exactly 3.1 miles, exactly 5K. And, uh, and when I do that, I get back and I'm like, wow, I feel great. It really, it really helps. I think it's the endorphins. Yes. Very true. Okay. Good stuff. Uh, let me see here. What are some more questions? Oh, this is a good question that had come in from Valerie. Is it possible to develop type one diabetes later in life? Yes. You can develop type one diabetes any time of life from infancy 
um, all the way up to 100 years old. Um, and uh, all it means is that your pancreas is no longer making insulin. Uh, but it could be that if your pancreas is making insulin that you have antibodies against the insulin and, and so you're, the antibodies bind to the insulin and block it from working. So now you've got insulin, uh, but the antibodies are blocking it. Uh, so, and then there's insulin receptor antibodies too. So it could be an autoimmune disease or that your pancreas is not, uh, not making insulin. And, and those are different illnesses and it's important to test. So test for all those. Somebody uh, later in life develops type one, man, test for it because um, th those are reversible. If you find out what it is, if it's an autoimmune, that's reversible. You're muted. Someone said that it sounds a little bit echoey. So let me know if anybody else is noticing that because I actually have a microphone, but I don't know if you can see it. I don't know if it's even working correctly. So we shall see, let me know. Okay, let's ask another question here. These are great questions, you guys. Uh, Tanya says, my numbers are not budging. My resting numbers at 6 a.m. are 126-ish and around 140 at 10. I'm so insulin resistant. It's disgusting. How do I get it down? Even when I fast, it will go up to 160 and I haven't eaten anything. Okay. Um, so sometimes a short-term fast causes what, what we were just talking about with the overnight fast. Uh, and that is that the, uh, the liver starts uh, making, the glucagon tells the liver to start making more, um, more glucose. And so the glucose level actually goes up. So it's one of the problems with following glucose is, is there's so many factors involved in what your glucose is that it's not easy uh, to know why that's happening. Uh, however, uh, the the, if you do it more of a long-term fast, then uh, your insulin resistance will improve. Um, but remember that when we talked that one time about uh, like the, the orthodontist moving your teeth, if they, if they try and move the teeth in the jaw and they push really hard, they're going to break teeth off or pull them out or, or whatever. Um, but if they put gentle pressure on the tooth, constant gentle pressure over a long period of time, even those teeth will move inside the bone of your jaw. Isn't that amazing? Um, but they, they do with just this constant gentle pressure. And that's kind of the way to look at this. And, and uh, don't get frustrated by, oh my gosh, it's not budging. You know, I, I fasted for 10 hours and it didn't do it um, or something. Um, uh, or, or even people, we've had people uh, who commented similarly, they get a three day fast. And, and the blood sugar was still, you know, 150 or whatever high. Um, it, it's not the, the one thing you do, the one time you do, it's the constant gentle pressure of intermittent fasting every day. You have a five hour window of eating um, and a 19 hour fast every day. Um, and, uh, or you're, you're fasting. Uh, we've had several people say they do three days once a month. Um, and, and, uh, and that has worked, um, or just following the phase one of the program and just do the, the, uh, less than 20 gram, uh, of, uh, carbohydrates in a day. So, um, so following the program and finding out what works for you, because for some people, um, the, the, if they're, if they're doing the less than 20 gram carbs, um, but they're eating a whole bunch of protein that remember the protein can be made into sugar. And some people like are really efficient at doing that. And so the high protein meals, their blood sugar will go up. So then they have to cut out protein. So there's only three things you have to stop eating um, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Everything else is okay. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. All right. Uh, Ken says I have IBSC. When it's getting bad, will that cause blood sugar to get nuts? So what, what is IBSC? Irritable, Ir bowel, irritable bowel syndrome. With the C. IBSC? Um, I don't know. Oh, Ir yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, uh, so the answer is uh, yes. Well, your IBS flares up when, the, when there's some kind of stressor, some kind of problem, some kind of infection. 
something wrong with the bacteria. Um, we normally have adjustments of the bacteria in our intestines. Uh, and, uh, and so when we have the wrong kind of bacteria, for example, uh, then there's a, um, a mechanism that, that the body has of growing good bacteria uh, to, it's really amazing how this works, to get rid of the bad bacteria. So there, wh whatever reasons for having the IBS um, are, uh, are going to increase your blood sugar just because of the inflammation or stress or whatever else is going on. All right. Uh, Rayanne says, I've been fasting once a month for the last six months. I'm seeing improvement. I'm 48 hours in and finally my blood sugar is under 100. That didn't happen in the past until closer to the third day of fasting. See, thank, thank you. Thank you. That's what I was talking about. Just keep going. Awesome. All right. We talked about berberine. Okay. Uh, Anonymous says, well, a healthy gut is essential for healing. You have two products. One is healthy gut restore and the other is for acid reflux. What is the difference or should both be taken at the same time? Okay. So, um, as far as uh, supplements go, the healthy gut restore is, is a restorative and that, and that's um, really what it's used for. Um, uh, it has um, probiotics, prebiotics and enzymes. So, so this is to improve digestion uh, and absorption and then add the bacteria, uh, add bacteria also into the large bowel. So uh, with all of that, uh, the, the healthy gut restore is for people who are, have digested issues. Um, the other thing that we have is the, um, the, uh, for acid reflux. So the reflux reliever is just to relieve a symptom of reflux. And some people, um, you know, they stop eating at four o'clock in the afternoon, their stomach's empty, they go to bed and they roll over and they get reflux. I actually had somebody today. And so he needs a reflux reliever. And so um, he would use the, the reflux reliever um, and he would not use the healthy gut restore because he doesn't have digestive issues. He actually digests his food really well. By the way, he's 94 years old and, um, and he's still working and he's going up and downstairs uh, all the time and uh, you know carrying um, uh, heavy things. He's, uh, it's amazing. Awesome. All right. Uh, Dan says, at my annual exam, my platelet count was low. And being a diabetic and my age of 69, they said, I have fatty liver. No tests were done. What tests should be done? Huh. Platelet counts were low. They have fatty liver. Okay. So there are ways to look at the blood tests and, and determine... Um, if there's likely to be fatty liver. So for example, the, the liver enzymes, AST and ALT uh, are, are commonly used for that. And if, if, if the AST and the ALT are under or around 20, uh, sometimes they're under in the teens or under 20, then it's very unlikely you have fatty liver. Um, but if they're in the thirties, even though technically it's normal, uh, that that's an indication that you may have fatty liver. So you can get some idea from the, the metabolic panel um, that you have fatty liver. And fatty liver just means you have a high turnover of liver cells. So a lot of cells are dying and they're dying faster than usual and they release their enzymes. And so you can see those enzymes in the blood and that's what they're testing for. So um, so that's a likely thing. Then they can't be sure of it unless they do an ultrasound or CT scan and actually look at the liver and say, oh yeah, your, your liver is all full of fat. Um, and then, and then the, the next question is, okay, what do I do about that? Guess what? It's phase one of the program. That's, what, that's a detox. When you're detoxing off of sugars, you're not getting something, especially the main sugar that causes fatty liver um, is fu fructose. Uh, so people think, oh, fructose, that's a fruit sugar. That's really good for you. And it's a low glycemic sugar and blah, blah, blah. 
Well, yes, 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 yes. But um, it also is, has to be processed by the liver and, uh, and uh, high levels of it um, do cause liver damage. And so uh, having a lot of fructose, high fructose corn syrup, honey, agave nectar, coconut sugar, uh, table sugar, those are all at least 50% fructose. Uh, and so when you go in the phase one of the program, you're off of all those things that none of those are going to be part of your life. So what happens? Your liver gets better. All right. Again, guys, BartonWebinar.com. That's where you're going to find that diabetes solution kit. Good stuff. Uh, Tanya had another question here. What are your thoughts on alternating my eating days? Like three days a week, fat, protein, and veggies. Oh, so I think, uh, maybe Saturday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, Wednesday, Friday, fat, protein, and veggies. And then Thursday, Saturday, fruit, veggies, and carbs, and then fast on Mondays. Any thoughts about that? Ooh, um, you know what? I would be very interested uh, for a study to be done on that because I, I, I'm really curious about this because th this is a real thing. So we have this whole group of people that are doing research on on high carb diets, like super high carb diets, like th they're eating hundreds of grams, 250, 300 grams of carbohydrates a day, um, but they have zero fat, they have no fat. And they're showing that they're, the um, insulin resistance goes down, they're, the people, the diabetes goes down uh, and, and people are getting better. And then they have the other end of people who have, uh, who, who are on a high fat diet, essentially what we do, the, the, um, the um, um, ketogenic diet. So the, the, the keto diet where, where you could have a bunch of fat, but you don't have any carbs. And, uh, and so, yeah, either way works. That's the thing. So my, my curiosity is exactly what you said. I wish that, well, you know what? If you got a CGM and tried it yourself, I'd be really interested to see how that works for you. But I'd like to see how a study done on that because if you eat fat, you're going to be insulin resistant for about eight hours after you eat fat. So that insulin resistance is going to make your blood sugar go up, make your insulin go up and cause more of the, the problem that you're dealing with. But what if you wait till the next day and then you're not insulin resistant from the fat and then you can eat carbs and have no fat? And so I, I, I'm really curious about to see if that works. I have a message here. This was an email that came through to customer support. And this is from Nazir. Nazir says, sometimes I'm using my Freestyle Libre 2 for 14 days, 14 days glucose check. Mostly it shows that my blood glucose goes high when I am doing a workout in the gym. Is that normal that the blood glucose goes high with a workout? Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Yes. Okay. So when you, that's exactly what I was talking about in the beginning. We talked about that, all of the reasons why it would go up. So uh, you start exercising and, and you stress your muscles and you're stressing your body. Um, you release more cortisol. And that release of cortisol makes you insulin resistant and that'll make your blood glucose go up. So, um, or, or if your glucose is low, you actually, your liver will start making glucose, but mostly it's from the insulin resistance part. Uh, Nazir also had asked in regards to healthy heart support, it says the dose says four capsules at once per day. Can those be spread out like maybe two in the morning and two in the evening? Um, wait, wait, what's spread out for the morning? Healthy heart support. Instead of taking all of those at once, I think it's four capsules. Can yeah. those be spread out like two in the morning and two at night? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can take them all together or you can spread it out. Either way is fine. Uh, that's the, 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 the way they work, uh, is to, uh, to decrease, um, stress hormone levels. Uh, and that, that's a big one to dilate blood vessels and to provide the nutrients that the heart needs, like CoQ10 for, for um, making energy. All right. Did that question, Tanya says, if I'm eating at 8 a.m. and 2.30 p.m., is it still important to stick to the 20 carb total? Uh-huh. 
Yeah. Dang. Yes. Yes. Stick to the qu 20, uh, stick to the 20 carb total. Um, uh, uh, so that you can get insulin sensitivity back uh, sooner. It'll, it'll work faster. It'll work better. And just to confirm, because this did come up in another question, it is net carbs. So you take your carbs minus the fiber. So it's like you get more food. You get more food if you do that. So yeah. Uh, Paul says, I first got numb feet in 1996 and I had not even been told that I was pre-diabetic until 15 to 20 years later. I got my diabetes diagnosis in 2019. How could my neuropathy have been caused by diabetes related reasons 20 plus years before I actually was told that I had diabetes and yet no doctor would tell me that I should heed the warning and adjust my diet radically? Okay, that that's an issue because... Because of having that definition, so we were talking about this earlier, you have a definition of diabetes and, and you say uh, the hemoglobin A1C, uh, 5.8, oh, that's pre-diabetes, 5.9, pre-diabetes, 6.4, pre-diabetes, 6.5, okay, now you have diabetes. Um, so what's the problem with that? Well, everybody says pre-diabetes, yeah, you know, no big deal, it's just pre-diabetes, so just watch your diet or whatever. Um, or if someone has neuropathy, uh, then, then the, um, what's not done is nobody looks for, why do you have neuropathy? Oh, you have insulin resistance. You got to deal with that. That's really important. And so, and it's part of the, the way we're taught in medical school to treat symptoms. And so they look at blood sugar as a symptom. Your blood sugar is not high. Okay. It's, it can't be diabetes. Um, and that's where the problem comes in because they don't test for insulin. I actually read an article about diabetes, about testing for diabetes and what you should do. And this endocrinologist, a famous endocrinologist from a major medical school says, oh, I never test insulin because I never find it useful because we're, we're just we're just focusing on the, the sugar, the glucose. That's all we care about. Um, but if you don't, then you don't know that there's insulin resistance going on, even when the blood sugar is normal, hemoglobin A1C is normal, and the, the, the insulin is sky high, and now you're gonna get neuropathy, or kidney failure, or Alzheimer's disease. Uh, okay, Ken had said, I think, I'm not sure if this is what it says, but he's been in a lot of pain for several months, which has made his blood sugar very hard to control, which is what we had just talked about. Yeah. So I think he's just mentioning that. It's the stress of that. Yeah. Uh, does berberine help in weight loss? Linwood would like to know. Um, actually, yes, <laughs> it is. Um, but um, for reasons that you might not expect. So we were talking about, uh, someone asked about what are the risks and benefits of of berberine, and I was thinking more of a risk, uh, but but there are some side effects, and one of them is the slowing of the intestines. The intestines kind of slow down, and uh, and so people get nausea, and they can even get vomiting, uh, and they can have intestinal problems, right? They can say, "Well, I don't, I'm not digesting food well, or whatever." Um, berberine can do that. Some people get that effect. Um, and, and so in the process of doing that, they don't eat as much. And so they actually lose weight. So the, the weight loss is due to two reasons. One is not eating as much. And the other one is uh, forcing your body to burn fat for energy and, instead of sugar. Another question about berberine. Frank says, if, if I'm using berberine, will my glucose and A1C go up? Um, well, it, it shouldn't, but the berberine is not the issue. The berberine is kind of a help for you to switch to a fat burning metabolism easier. Um, and, and really it's phase one of the program. It's the program that gets you, uh, to your hemoglobin A1C and glucose to drop. So kind of piggyback on that, Mary says, or Maddie, sorry, says, what is the dosage you should take of berberine if you are type two diabetic? and you should gradually get off of metformin? Well, you don't have to gradually get off of metformin. Metformin is just, uh, it, it's there, it, it inhibits the cyclic AMP, and then it's, when it's not, it's not. It's not one of those kind of things that 
that you know you have to build a level and to get off it gradually it's 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 just like it's on it's off you take it you don't take it it doesn't matter so uh so then your next question is the how much berberine um 500 milligrams twice a day is good um I, I, our supplement is 800 milligrams twice a day um mainly because we're working with um, we want it to be sufficient for all of the different uses and not just for diabetes. And 800 is great for a type two diabetic, um, especially if you're going to stop taking uh, metformin. Alec has a question here. No, it says I take glicoside, but I wonder if it's glipizide instead of metformin. And does, okay. this, does this react the same as berberine and metformin? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, no, they work totally differently. So glipizide is something that causes you to make more insulin. That's, that's all it does. It tricks your body into making more insulin. So, so when you, when you eat something, instead of making this much insulin, you make this much insulin. And so that's supposed to bring your blood sugar down better. But remember, you don't want that insulin resistance is the problem. So so uh, glipizide is one of those medications I take people off of right away, just like, oh, no, bad medication, because that's going to cause more insulin resistance, even though it may bring the blood sugar down, it causes more insulin resistance. So could they use that with metformin? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, you could use them together, wouldn't, would not be a problem. You could use glipizide metformin, or you can use berberine and glipizide, either way, it's okay. All right. My friend is type two diabetic and has changed his diet with metformin. He is having problems controlling his blood sugar. His PSA is 6.5. What's PSA? Prostate specific antigen. Okay. Could this be the reason why he is having problems with his blood sugar? No, no, not likely. The, the PSA goes up for the, the prostate gets enlarged or whatever. <laughs> that's, if that's if that's the case, um, then uh, not likely. Um, there are stressors associated with if, if it's like prostate cancer or something. Yeah, that that would affect it possibly. Um, so uh, so but but not being able to control your blood sugar, that's really important. And, and you should know that, that uh, okay, th um, that's not working and taking the medications is not working and taking supplements is not working, um, but really the program. So do phase one of the program and, uh, and detox from the sugar so that your insulin comes down to a normal level. Yes. All right, Beverly says, I'm going to Scotland on Monday. The time will change. How do I deal with the different timing of my medicines? At the moment, I take four kinds of HTN meds, three painkillers, three tummy meds, and a muscle relaxant. And since I found you, I've added Cinechroma, turmeric, and berberine. Wow, that's a lot of pills. Okay, so uh, so okay, I'm I'm going to give you a secret. This is actually um, NASA did some research on on circadian rhythm, and 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 one of the things they looked at was jet lag. Um, that how do you change to the, the uh, current time? So uh, it, when you change to a different time zone, how do you change your body right away? And, and the, the number one best way to do that is with food. So what you do is you fast for 24 hours before you land in Scotland. And, and um, <clears throat> no, 24 hours before your first meal in Scotland, and then you eat your first meal is um, breakfast in Scotland. So, and, and don't, if, if you land at, at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and somebody says, let's go out to lunch. Uh, you say, no, uh, my first meal is tomorrow morning at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and that, that, that morning eight o'clock meal is what gets your uh, adrenal glands started. Um, the other thing is sunshine. If you could get sunshine, I know Scotland doesn't have a lot of sunshine, uh, but if you get over there and you get sunshine right away, that's actually a good way uh, to, to change over too. So getting sunshine during their sunshine time and, uh, and, then, and then eating. So those are the two things that are the most important. 
Tom says, I finished a seven day fast on Saturday. Sunday, I started eating and I took 150 milligrams of Avapro for blood pressure. I almost passed out in the afternoon because my blood pressure was 90 over 50. I have not taken Avapro since. Just now, my blood pressure is 138 over 83. Is that okay? I want low blood pressure because I have microalbumin in my urine. Okay. So the microalbumin is not related to the blood pressure. Uh, so, um, but uh, a... Uh, your blood pressure, was it 128 over 83? Is that what it 138. was? 138. 138 over 83? Okay. Um, that, and I, did he say how old he was? Mm -mm. No. Okay. So um, what's really interesting is that, that um, as we age, because the, our arteries uh, tend to be kind of firmer and they're not, they're not as compliant, um, that we need more blood pressure to get uh, the the blood, the circulation to the, all of the areas of the body. And so the uh, increased blood pressure to around 140 is an optimum place to be. So um, so that's a, di a systolic of, of 140 is optimum. And, uh, and, and yes, the blood, if you fasted, your blood pressure is going to come down to normal and then you take a blood pressure medication and that drops it, you know, through the floor, so to speak. Uh, and that's where the dizziness comes from. So, yeah, I, I often tell people when they're fasting, be very careful of blood pressure medications. In fact, I don't even recommend them during a fast, no blood pressure medications, no blood sugar medications, because a lot of them tell your body to make that make insulin and you're not eating anything. And so that'll drop your blood sugar too low. So the pressure, the sugar, those are kind of important. Avoid those. Um, but, okay, so for the microalbumin, that's really important. And what's wrong is the energy of the, the kidneys. The kidneys aren't getting enough energy um, because of the insulin resistance. So what need, what you need is not to improve your blood pressure, what you need is to improve your insulin sensitivity. So uh, phase one of the program is a good way to do that. Fasting is a great way to do that. And however that, however fasting looks, keeping your stomach empty as much as possible um, is a very good way to improve your insulin sensitivity. Awesome. All right, Dr. Saunders, that's it for today. See you okay. tomorrow. Okay, hasta, hasta mañana. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. That's all we have time for. I know we have questions that are left, but come back next week. We'll do the same thing. And then we also have our Healthy Heart webinar tomorrow. And that starts at 12 noon central time. Uh, if you haven't registered for that, you can do so at bartonwebinar.com. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. And I hope you found some good information to help you in your health journey. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.